impact on the way we work uh, with each other, collaboratively with others, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, as she at one point said, she would like us to be our authentic selves. And that was a very interesting invitation because the question is not this idea of trying to speak to how you think you should work together, but how you actually work together. Because there is a bit of a difference because, you know, there's this idea that, you know, husband and wife, we work together. It's like a dance, you know, backwards and forwards and so on. But the reality for us is that it works slightly differently and we try to describe it as accurately as we can to try and think what is the nature of collaborative creative work uh, beyond the sort of myths of what we think it should be but rather what it is and we titled uh, our presentation tectonic shifts uh, beginning to think through metaphors in a way now the exhibition that we did uh, was really like a first draft of a book. So we very often design books and publish books. And what we do is we make them in sheets that we can fold out, put on a wall, and they become a display as a series of pages. And this is the same. It's both scrolls that run vertically, and there are pages of a book. And this book is, this is sort of the first draft. It was done very, very fast. And it was done under the idea of uh, uh, focusing on decoloniality and decarbonization. <clears throat> we put it in a suitcase and we unfolded it in a day, and that was the exhibition. And it can very easily be returned uh, to South Africa. And in that sense, it is a very low impact um, display, so to speak. Um, now, what we started thinking about, you can see it's a wall of about 15 by 5 meters. You can see the two figures there at the bottom. Um, and what it is, is a series of 10 vertical scrolls that are books, so to speak, um, with titles underneath. There are nine titles for 10 books. Um, and the nine titles reflect on issues that's just in the studio at the moment. So. In that sense, this is not a carefully considered lexicon of everything that our office is about. It's like a studio visit where somebody knocks on the door and they say, what are you busy with? And we simply show what's on the tables, what's in our mind, and it's just a conversation in the moment. No much more serious than that. Um, and there are a few things from titles like uh, Critical Intimacy, uh, Public Culture, uh, Lightness, superstructures and substructures, titles like that of things that we are busy with. Then there's a book that doesn't have a name, simply because there are always things in the studio that you're busy working on that you don't quite know what it is. You know you're doing it, you know it's serious for you, but exactly how to describe it is unknown because there's a reciprocity between making and thinking, and these are sometimes things that's made without knowing exactly what's the thoughts to relate to it or there are thoughts without knowing what you're going to make out of it but they sort of in the process of unfolding so there, there are some strange and obscure drawings there there are some bits of writing and so on that then begin to point towards a possible kind of a future but if you look at this drawing you'll see it looks like a bit of a mountain or something Something, and that is because we thought of thinking of collaboration and our collaboration and our collaboration with others through a metaphor of a geological section. Now, uh, in terms of a geological section, is that it has struck us that Ilz and I are quite different individuals and we work in a very different way. So might be married, we have children, we sit next to each other in the office, we work together all day, but we work in a different way, we focus on different things, we have different personalities. And that in the nature of collaborative work, the question is, how does one allow each other to grow and be your authentic selves, to give full expression to it without owing your partner anything in that process? In other words, you don't have to grow towards them, you can grow in whichever way you want. Um, so, in a way, that is this layer of petrified um, 
rock that we find at the surface of the uh, earth. Um, and uh, what happens with, with the surface of the earth, there are two things that can happen. It can move apart or it can move together. And that movement of the, surf, uh, the earth's surface is a function of the hot viscous layers that's below it. So if the hot viscous layers are moving currents away from each other, it causes a tectonic rift. It causes the coast, the edge of a continent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when they're moving together, it means that you have the stratification of layers of work, of years of us building and forming ourselves, our own pro projects and so on, and they exist next to each other. And then because of the hot undercurrent moving towards each other, in other words, this collaboration that we have, there's the kind of transformation of the landscape, like the drawing that you see on the right, which means that there's sort of a folding of the Earth's surface. And we became interested in that. We also were very interested in the fact that, you know, we have severe electricity cuts at the moment in the office. And one of the things that we got into is just to make sun prints, cyanotype prints, where you use this sort of a chemical, you use the sun to develop it, and you can print architectural drawings into blueprints, or you can print photographs and all sorts of things. And we thought that we're going to use this technology as a way of making the wall display. And there you can see the final thing, uh, the linen in scrolls with the themes underneath it. You see the themes then dark, dark blue at the bottom, and you see a series of drawings and photographs, and you see also four screens. So the screen on the left is showing one of the most important movies that we put out, uh, Summer Flowers which you can go and see on our website. Um, and then there are some other movies about work that we've done with students at Harvard University and Goa and in Venice, all sorts of places. And then the last one was a movie that, that we called Search for Light, which is showing a very large scale mo models that we build in our studio in Cape Town and how we put them in daylight as a way of understanding the exact light intensity and light quality. And you can see in this, uh, uh, this is in a way like, like photographs that you'd find on a studio table uh, of things that we're busy looking at. So uh, there you get some sense of what it looks like and feels like. Oh, this thing is frozen now. Yeah, we're back. Think. Oh, there you go. They. Oh, now it's on autopilot. Um, so you can see in the previous one, you can see what we did is to limit the file size, because if you do gigantic displays, you can't just have one single Photoshop file or an InDesign file. You break it up into pieces. So we broke it up into these pieces of linen that we printed, and then we just stitched it together. Um, and this, I mean, it's a very big topic in our office, but we are thinking about how digital futures coincide with things that's made by hand and how a material reality and a digital reality coincide. And this is also a conversation about that. Um, and then in the uh, display were some photographs and some of these photographs are photographs that we ponder on for years. You know, this is probably the most famous photograph in our office of a photograph that is hanging here in the office that we've been thinking about, you know, uh, in short, thinking about how infrastructure is built around what we have, around the things that people have, and around their knowledge, rather than the sort of structure in the back. Um, and then what we did for the Venice Biennial is that we made a, a series of drawings that take things that's happened that we don't have photographs of, and we reduce them to drawings. So this was a funeral that we organized for a building, which was a public building, a cinema, um, and with that was a funeral march down the main road, down to a cafe. And we have films of it. We have loose photos, but never anything had summarized it. So we made some of those drawings. We made some drawings that are not completely rational, complete sections through buildings, but that show portions of buildings or things like this that then show portions of buildings. Uh, and photographs of buildings and so on. But in short, you can cut out of it, is that what this was is to just show the things that we are busy considering and to make the statement 
that in the nature of collaboration, um, you can quit. Um, you can, um, uh, in the nature of collaboration, you have the need for each one of the parties who collaborate to be able to be themselves with the others trusting them that they're going to do good stuff as they're doing it. But it is not to grow into one sort of unit. We don't think that that is, you know, if Eels and I start wearing the same tracksuits, it's not going to make things better. Uh, it's going to make it worse. Um, and in that sense, there is uh, the sense of the sort of articulated petrified rock. It, it solidifies into a series of projects. They might be similar, they might be different, but that the uh, necessity for collaboration is to allow each other to be who they are, are from their own subjectivities and from their own subconscious in a way. Mm. I'll maybe just leave it there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to um, the second half of the presentation, which is dealing with more specific projects. Um, that is, okay, in, it's actually framed within this um, within this work. Now, I have no idea how to, now, oh, so stop sharing. Okay, <laughs> there we go. <sighs> Sorry. Um, we are used to Zoom. <laughs> Teams Please always give us trouble. Oh, we don't know if it's a continental thing or whether we're stupid. It's not continental, it's institutional. Yes. <laughs> okay, let me just close Meant this. to torment us. Yeah. Close. So at least we didn't burn a whole lot of fossil fuels to get to yeah. you to give this lecture, but it's not as satisfying as being with you. Hey, there yeah. you are. Oh, we see your faces now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. We didn't see you before. Okay. Ah, it's lagging already. <laughs> it's lagging a lot. Okay, wait. I need to open the file first. So, Ilz and I always have the issue because we are husband and wife team, is that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the era of Zoom means that we suddenly uh, were invited to all of things because nobody's embarrassed to invite us. Okay. <laughs> so you see that? Yeah. Yeah, we see it. Okay. So now I'm going to full screen, so it should be there. All right. So I've titled this uh, talk um, "Some Notes from Cape Town" because there is obviously a very historic. Um, conversation between Cape Town and Holland, as I do, probably do not have to go into much. Um, Cape Town being the kind of space where the colonial encounter happened between indigenous Cape Townians and um, the Dutch. So these are kind of thinking through what is actually happening spatially from our practice in Cape Town and talking to, to you guys in, in Holland, right, in, as a Dutch audience. And one of the things that I think I'm going to just briefly touch on is a, a project that we that we invested quite a lot of our time in, and it has to do with a factory that was designed by two architects. One is actually a Dutch architect, the one called um, Henk Nichelman, and his partner, um, whose name I literally just forget, Max Polakansky and um, oh. Andrews. Doug Andrews. Doug Andrews. So they designed a factory in Cape Town in, 19, um, in the 1940s. Uh, uh, and what you see on the screen is one of the rooms in this factory. Um, and it's in fact, the canteen of this factory. Um, and what you see me cutting up now is one part of um, the canteen called the tea wheel. And what happened in this room is that um, the workers who at this point um, separated in terms of their race, in terms of their gender, and in terms of their class were um, given this opportunity to have a tea break, but also constructed within the way that the factory bosses uh, wanted them to have their tea, which was very quickly. Um, and the tea wheel was a way of distributing the tea in a manner that would be efficient. And people would line up next to the tea tea wheel, grab the cup of tea and then go sit next to the next to the tea wheel and have their um, 
have their, their five minute break. There were screens that would then also begin to separate people um, sort of in terms of their class, gender and race. Um, and our, our work in Cape Town spatially is really kind of riffing off this idea of um, how space can, number one, construct um, and continue to construct these realities of, um, or these unrealities of uh, spatial violence of, of constructing identities. But we then want to kind of begin to analyze and unpack and restructure and rearrange um, space according to our ideas of freedom. Um, that is a kind of a glimpse of where um, workers would sit in numbers of four. The, the screen there was would separate the black workers from the from the white workers. And um, this, this project eventually became a book called Unstitching Rex Trueform, the story of an African factory, um, which really is a biography of um, how this particular set of buildings became to construct what we now know as contemporary Cape Town and how it participated in the spatial violence of apartheid around separation, um, but also how it has deep roots within a colonial structure of how we think about architecture and buildings in space. So um, our entire narrative around thinking about architecture is kind of founded around um, this, this work that we did in, in analyzing these, these sets of buildings. These sets of buildings have a particular personal um, attachment for me because many of my ancestors and my um, family members worked in factories like these at, um, and they were seamstresses and they were, um, you know, weavers and, and and in the cutting rooms and this with these particular buildings have a very um, special place in the social imagination of not only my family but many families of Cape Town um, many other families in Cape Town so as an architect I began to look at both the kind of technical study of the building but also the social history and trying to understand what is the colonial legacy or the, or the apartheid legacy of these buildings and how we can begin to construct spaces of freedom around that. Another image I would like to share with you is also a kind of foundational image of a project that we are actually nearing completion with um, in in one of the neighborhoods in around our around next to, next to our practice, which is an art school for the University of the Western Cape. But when we started researching our approach to this building, we came across this image of um, enslaved people. Um, or uh, recently enslaved people, and um, it, it is, it's a grey area in terms of how this image was taken post the abolition of sla slavery. But um, what you see in this image is essentially um, enslaved people from Indonesia, from um, Malaysia, from Sierra Leone that came to the Cape um, because of the Dutch uh, colonial uh, slave in, um, enterprise, um, and how this architecture that is constructed around the practices of um, commerce, of gathering, of being, is in the foreground um, of the colonial architecture that you see in the background. And I've, we've also looked at these images very, very particularly to understand the spatial logics around that, because on the one hand, the colonial architecture is in the background, but it is sort of um, uh, depicted as very stable, very um, strong and very, uh, you know, omnipresent in a way, whereas the architecture of, of enslaved people is on the foreground, but it is a precarious state. It's a state of, um, you know, uh, nomadism. It's a state of kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a mobile state. And this is the current situation as well, where um, you have the kind of state infrastructure, which is sort of omnipresent, and um, in the background, and you have um, sort of an informalized um, st structure in the, in, the, in the foreground. So this picture became very important for us to kind of think through how we approach our current st stability, our current um, situation. So what I'm going to move through then is a, a particular project that we were um, lucky to have um, in our in our office, or lucky, not lucky, but it's a, it was a challenge to our office uh, um, as we were um, commissioned to do this. But essentially, 
we were approached to look at the um, museum that once was the um, last resting place for Cecil John Rhodes. For those who don't know, but Cecil John Rhodes was one of the prime um, imperialist um, and architects of apartheid in South Africa. And this house is dedicated to his legacy. And through the research and thinking about how to reimagine the space, I came up with a title called A Cottage to Breathe In. So let me start with um, the kind of a, a, a quotation from a writer called Bessie Head. Um, and she says, and she describes Cecil John Rhodes as, the best way I can explain it is, is in the words of an industrial millionaire who used his money to conquer the interior of Southern Africa. His main area of conquest, and he waged two wars against the people, was Zimbabwe, which formerly had his name, Rhodesia. When he waged the last war of conquest in 1896, he said, I have taken everything from them but the air. Person and you feel choked. You feel like even the air has been taken because so many vast areas of has been reserved for white occupation only. There's nothing there for black people. So like I said, in mid 2021, we were appointed through a public tender process by the city of Cape Town to develop a conservation management plan for the Rhodes Cottage. And that is a, that's just an image of um, evoking um, the memory of, of Bessie Head, the, the person behind that quotation. But um, the scope of the work included writing a statement of significance based on the history of the site of this cottage, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, and an action plan that would cover the management of the site in terms of securing public safety, site conservation, education and research. In other words, we were awarded the task of outlining how this building should be managed for public use. But in order for us to really take on this task mindfully and creatively, we first had to understand the building and its historic presence for ourselves. And also, this is a building that we never really encountered in our day-to-day -day life. It's kind of um, something that we know about, but we also don't really encounter. So we aligned our thinking with the opening epigraph of what Bessie Head said, the voice of Bessie Head. Um, and then if we think about um, what she said, we really couldn't approach this in a politically neutral way, even though it looks like a very sort of harmless little cottage. So the building is a modest but stately sea-facing sea cottage along Falls Bay um, of Cape Town and functions today as a house museum dedicated to the life of Cecil John Rhodes, as I've just mentioned. It formed part of Rhodes' very large estate, an estate that included the University of Cape Town, Grotesky Manor House, um, as well as Boschendal Farm and Kirsten Bosch Gardens. But Rhodes acquired this humble cottage in 1899 in Musenberg, and which at that time, the area only consisted of a few farms and a number of fishing huts, as you see in, um, in the photograph. Um, and it was really a kind of a, um, a space, a working space for people to, um, to survive off the land and the sea. The timing of Rhodes' purchase and his use of the house coincided with the South African War, which unfolded between 1899 and 1902. And the, the war officially began in, in October um, 1899, in part as a consequence, actually, of the failed Jameson rage, um, raid, which was instigated by Rhodes and his compatriots in 1885. Um, there was also a, um, a camp that was set up um, to house some of the injured soldiers from, from the war and was the space right in front of the cottage was used as a, a space for recuperation for injured, um, injured soldiers of that war. But the war ended in 1902 and a few months after Rhodes's death. Um, and despite um, owning many more illustrious and exp expansive properties in Cape Town, he chose this humble um, cottage near the Atlantic Ocean 
to recuperate and also because he was ill. He actually suffered from a respiratory disease. He couldn't breathe properly. He was always in need of fresh air to be able to, um, to, 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 be, to be stable. And in this house, he um, actually, towards the end of his life, he died in this house and he um, ordered some of the people that were, um, that were his servants to knock just a hole through one of, the, one, of the, one of the walls, just crudely knock a wall, not even to make a window, but he asked people to knock a wall, knock a hole through the wall so that the air could just come through and he could breathe, he could breathe. So in this talk, I could really include um, a lot out more details of his death. Um, for instance, the fact that the South African government actually organized a state funeral for Rhodes, um, but not just a funeral, but his, um, his, his body needed to be transported from Musenberg to Zimbabwe, um, 2,000 kilometers away to the Matopo, the Matopo Hills. Um, and in that process of, of this, this funeral, this like epic funeral procession, um, it would stop in the major towns along Southern Africa and people would then pay respect. There wasn't a railway that could actually do this job at the time. So the railways, um, railway tracks were, were actually under construction as this funeral procession was happening. And, um, you know, uh, that work was mainly done by um, black Zimbabweans at the time. Um, so in the house at the moment, you don't hear really of the kind of um, violence around uh, orchestrating something like the funeral. You only sort of hear the triumphant side of Rhodes um, and the kind of thinking about him as a mining magnet and an imperialist. There are minor sort of, um, you know, thinkings around, uh, minor notes about him as not being a, a complete hero. But the dominant history of him in that in that um, in that cottage is of him being this kind of very important, significant um, character in in his in in this time. For instance, you also don't see um, or hear this album that Yuma Sekela wrote or composed in 1976, calling Cecil John Rhodes a colonial man, um, a, a special kind of song written in, in protest against Rhodes. Um, you also don't, for instance, see books by Dambuzo Marashera, who uh, grew up in the post Rhodes era and, um, you know, suffered many of the kind of colonial consequences of, of, of still John Rhodes' oppression of Southern Africans um, and wrote about it in this book called House of Hunger. But more importantly and more curiously, you don't see the contemporary kind of of protests against Cecil John Rhodes that happened in 2015 at the University of Cape Town, University of the Western Cape and other universities in Cape Town, asking and really agitating for a revision of Rhodes's memory and memorializing a revision and a protest that actually ended up with the um, taking down of his statue at the university. I'm referring particularly to the Rhodes Must Fall movement. So these these notes, these kinds of counter narratives is not at all in the museum as we see it today. So the task of this, um, you know, this conservation management plan that we did for the city of Cape Town was complex, you know, so we needed on the one hand to give them a sense that or give them a plan of how to maintain this building. Um, but at the same time, also give them a, a direction or a proposal of how to revise the narrative that's within the space. And um, you know, one of the many one of the many things that we began to look at is maybe it's not the story is not with the main house, but maybe it's within the um, the little cottage next to the house because the main house dominates the site, but on the side of the cottage um, you have um, you have this, this this caretaker's cottage that really becomes the fulcrum of a, a particular kind of potential emancipatory practice. Because what we then found is that although the history of um, roads dominates the site, this site is over 200 years old, and the history of enslaved people 
people, the history of migrant workers, the history of Filipinos that came here is completely not told on the site. And, um, you know, fishermen's histories is a very important part of that of that um, of that world, and it's completely not even thought about. So when we arrived on the site in June 2021, we found these three buildings on, on the site, and um, you can see to the far right of the picture, um, that's the dominant building, and you can just see the um, the cottage sort of tucked in the middle of 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 um, of of the cottage. With at the back, there's a very big house dedicated to another mining magnet, and on the left is a um, building. But we found a small inscription in the archive said that this house potentially could have been a fisherman's cottage. From the historic sources, I found out more about the development of the area and why it is completely plausible that the foundations of the house would be those of a fisherman's cottage. In 1742, Simon's Bay became a permanent winter anchorage for the Dutch, meaning cattle was kept there permanently. It was militarized with construction of protective fortifications built to protect against outside attacks. So the Dutch then militarized that whole bay so that um, you know they can protect it against French, Portuguese, and English um, English uh, occupation. Indigenous and local inhabitants built structures for living, storing fish, and lived off natural resources such as seafood and fresh water. And I've already shown some of those pictures. Um, there was also conflict between Dutch settlers and local indigenous groups since the, the Dutch really settled very aggressively um, by oppressing local indigenous groups and unethically claiming land for the purposes of expanding colonial rule. And this whole um, conflict really culminated in the 1795 Musenberg battle um, 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 and, um, and, 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 and sort of kind of began to signify a, for that kind of rigorous sort of claiming of land by by uh, Dutch settlers. Um, and then we also have this 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 kind of sense that you know this is sort of pre this is this is still in the kind of um, uh, era of, of enslaving people for labor but post slavery um, post the abolition of, of slavery ex Muslim people ex enslaved Muslim people settled as fishermen and women and women um, and 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 they also began to settle in the area and it become it became a very cosmopolitan space so we wrote that into the into our document we said to the um, custodians of the museum that this history is not just about roads it needs to incorporate all these other narratives within the site and we ask that you know this history becomes revised and it becomes actually a space for healing again, you know, so that people that have some claim to this history of the site, people from Zimbabwe, people from um, Zambia that, uh, you know, uh, were, that felt the consequences of, of Rhodes' very oppressive rule, and then also local descendants of indigenous and enslaved people should have real claim to this building, which is really a fascinating and beautiful um, location. Um, so the fact that Rhodes actually died there from the lack of um, being able to breathe, we actually said this building could be a space for breathing, but space for breathing on a societal level. Um, why don't we open it up? Why don't we knock down these very harsh, stuffy walls of oppression and offer it to the public as a way of reconciling and um, the way of thinking? And we gave them all kinds of resources um, and people and, and networks to begin to think through. But then we 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 got we got a um, you know this is also just linking back to Bessie Head and how she described her house in Serowe, um, where she describes it also as a space of breathing and a space of um, of welcoming, and how and as a, a kind of a a, a a signifier of what Rhodes Cottage could potentially be if it is opened up for a society societal healing space. So. <clears throat> We submitted our report um, and we had to wait for some kind of comment. And the one comment is the one body that comments is um, the Musenberg um, Historical Conservation Society. I call them the Musenberg Hysterical um, Conservation Society because they are the ones that are actually so, um, you know. Mm -hmm. 
roads. They then wrote back an 11 page um, comment to our report, um, asking for all kinds of things and co commenting on, on various parts of, of, the, of, um, of, of, of the report. But some of the things that they said was that um, even though our plan and our ethics of engagements was largely approved by the city of Cape Town, the main stakeholder, the Musenberg Historical Conservation Society heavily opposed the plan, and they said that we were proposing to delegitimize the property and Cecil John Rhodes and completely erase him, um, and also to relocate him to a dark corner and thoroughly cancel him in the most brutal terms. This is this is a quotation from from their commenting um, from their comments. They also said that we as architects should be neutral. Um, and our activism slant is unprofessional um, and, th and that our references to various settle settler colonial regimes that claim ownership of the land is, and are disparaging remarks aimed at nothing more than the cancellation of white society. Um, they also said that our proposal was viciously anti-white and that the fact that we want to um, dwell on um, uh, the projects of um, or the violent projects of, of, of enslaved people's histories, they called that emotive. But finally, and this was really the kind of uh, really struck a chord with me um, in terms of how vicious these comments were in terms of um, coming back to us, they, um, they actually um, referred to one of our texts where we said that you know, this is a landscape that is also about, you know, uh, linking back to indigenous histories and indigenous people. They said that we shouldn't really consider that because the Khoi, who was the, the indigenous people um, being referred to, were largely um, extirpated and, um, you know, extirpated by smallpox and uh, in, socio in sociological, and this is a quotation, in sociological terms, they were displaced by a more powerful society. So the argument was that we shouldn't really be looking at indigenous histories because, you know, um, they were replaced by more powerful society, which is, you know, Rhodes, the, the society that then um, attaches themselves to the Rhodes legacy. Horrible, um, in our opinion. But we were we were prepared for some pushback, but the extent to which it would reveal certain parts of society's passion for denying historical spatial violence, this was really an unwelcome surprise. Um, it, it reinforced also our sense that we need to continue this work of um, archaeology, archaeology of, um, you know, tracing, of being, being, you know, very upfront about foregrounding Indigenous histories, Indigenous and um, uh, you know oppressed um, uh, um, architectures, and um, you know um, the dominant histories of place that that continue to um, that continue to kind of you know be omnipresent. But this engagement also informed that we should indeed embrace the unprofessional nature of the task. Um, in order to in, to invoke change, we were accused of being unprofessional. So, if unprofessional means that we are um, asking for a more open truth, then I'm very happy to be an unprofessional architect. And I think our practice embraces that sense of unprofessionalism. But ultimately, you know, um, our working methodologies relies on a continuous search of ways of how to broaden our profession as architects beyond the construction of buildings, but also toward the construction of social cohesion and spaces of freedom. Um, so, so when we return to the space of breathing, um, you know, I already mentioned that we can think of the space as a kind of a um, space where we can renew um, our insights and renew our, our, our ways of thinking and renew social cohesion and the conversations around social cohesion. And then lastly, um, Heinrich already showed this picture. Um, 
in um, and you showed a glimpse of it that we showed in the Venus Biennale, but this image really becomes for us a, a mantra, you know, a mantra of how how we can be. Mm. This image is around this idea that we've um, attached ourselves to, and it's an idea that was crafted by um, the, the black radical tradition scholar Fred Moten and um, Manolo Callahan, who is a peace worker and peace scholar um, working in um, the United States. So the house that Katrina Majit, who's in this image, built in this photograph will be 33 years old this year. And Paul Grendon, who took this photograph, um, captured her building this house in a place called Sundrift, near Steinkop in what is today known as the Northern Cape. We see the image that she's building in a house from materials gathered from around her, and she uses a physical strength to bend the frames, which would later be enshrouded with woven grass mats. So this house would eventually be called a Mikey's Haze because of the mats. The mats will cover and shield against harsh sun during the day and cold air at night. But what we also see are her belongings and a person already inside the construction in process. In other words, she is building around what she already has with what she has gathered and around what she has gathered. So at traditional architecture schools, from the ones that, that I definitely um, attended at the University of Cape Town, a very colonial institution with a very colonial episteme, we do not learn about this particular intelligence of building. And if we do, it is framed as a tradition of the past rather than a, than a practice of the present. Like I said, this building is 33 years old. When we learn to make buildings in architecture schools, the traditional curriculum demands that we conceive of the new building as a potential new and empty space, later to be filled with things accumulated over time. We know about the, dear, the idea of the tabula rasa, the so-called clean slate, and this dominates the standard curriculum. It's a very colonial idea of, you know, the empty land, you know, that is how colonial settlers encounter these new worlds. Empty sites, vacant lots, and open land is assumed and often a prerequisite there to fill with new innovative ideas held together with walls that would divide up in the service space and serve spaces, the public spaces from the private spaces. Clarity and order is equated with elegance and sophistication. But what we really see in this photograph is a demonstration of a particular habit of assembly a knowledge of construction and a method of gathering that does not easily distinguish between what is gathered and who is gathering. There's no linear notion and distinction between when is the time to gather and when is the space ready for gathering. Instead, we see a construction of life where both happens simultaneously alongside each other and with other things. The water tank, which you see in the background, is captured linking with the construction of the Ronde Hayes, Mikey's Hayes, and it isn't seen as a part, of, as a, like a separate part. The simultaneity of all orders captured in the image is a design intelligence worthy of paying attention to. And if we are serious about building new freedoms, new worlds and habits, we should really pay attention to the practice that we see in this photograph. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, I think um, stop sharing. Yeah, you can stop sharing if you want. If you want. Thank you. Yeah, then we have a better view. Um, but yeah, I think some people may have some questions. Okay. Thank but you. Some questions. People. All right. Okay. Huh? How's everybody feeling after that? <laughs> are we feeling good are we feeling disturbed <laughs> unsettled yeah. it's not That's easy the these conversations are never easy um it's meant to kind of you know help us think through but what i try to also just figure out is like how can we 
both analyze and both um, be analytical and critical, but also begin to construct freedom because we, we as we as notes from Cape Town, we cannot just be, um, you know, disabled by the colonial enterprise. We are, we, we've enabled ourselves. We've, we definitely are kind of thinking about how do we actually, um, what are the, our own, um, our own, um, you know, emancipatory spatial practices. Um, and we look at people like Katrina Majit, we look at people like Bessie Head, we look at people like Fred Moten. These are not technically or, uh, you know, they're not, they're not um, disciplined, they're not within the discipline of architecture, but for us, they are very strong spatial practitioners of other, and we've got a kind of a, a roll call of people that we look to, to help us think through. So uh, I've also read the article that you uh, send us, and yeah. we also uh, yeah attached it to the email we sent out to the to the students. And what actually I kind of wrap my head around is the situation with the museum and the position yeah. it's taken. I mean, uh, you know, looking at the the history as it is, you would assume that the museum would look at an equal history and would look at it with an open uh, view and would try to incorporate all all yeah all kinds of people, right? So yes. uh, how now the, the situation is with the project and what happened after uh, the 11 page report was uh, submitted and uh, also your response because uh, you know you wrote the article so I'm guessing that's one of the outputs you've used and how is this continuing? Uh, yeah. um, so I can I can report to say that you know the museum custodians the Munis the Musenberg historical conservation body they actually represent both a very marginal and a very dominant voice it's a simultaneous position because they occupy the site but they, at the same time they actually don't have a lot of power in terms of um, uh, you know um, making decisions those decisions are lying with heritage authorities as well as the city of Cape Town the city of Cape Town has you know, rented this building out and they've got a five year lease. Um, and once that five year lease is up, they have to find a new tenant and they have to find a new logic for it. But um, so, so our proposal has been unanimously supported by Heritage Western Cape. They embrace the, the, the everything in there. Um, you know, so they, they're not even giving the, the, the museum owners at, at any time of day. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, there's a popular kind of, you know, uh, um, hanging on to this history, which is also very, very strong. Um, just yesterday, I was, um, you know, I, it was amazing, but there's a student at UCT that written a whole essay on the museum incorporating the work that we did. And um, after hearing about what we proposed, he's actually written this essay as a kind of a, um, in support of our proposal um, and in support of the movement and trying to um, be in solidarity with that, but also speak back to the museum owners and say, look, guys, this is really regressive. We need to move on. Um, and there's there's good ideas here to to do that. Um, so so some and I think I think the essay in architectures of refusal, because it is an academic paper and it is landing on some people's desks as research, has actually is making some kind of a difference. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. You can add to it, otherwise we have. Uh, can I yes, yeah. <laughs> can I ask a question? Of course. Um, yes. Also for your um, for your lecture and uh, Mr. Wolf as well, um, I was curious: how does the 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 construct of new space uh, in free way look like? Are you also involved in these uh, kind of uh, construction, or is it just an analytic um, analyzing what uh, is the past? Yeah, so a very good question, and this is something that Heinrich also brings up quite often. Um, this lecture is a very small slice of our practice, so there's a much fuller lecture that includes our building projects and how these projects then begin to um, implement its ways in actual um, building projects. We don't, we we make we make buildings like a, a very like like a very um, you know like well-known architectural practice, but. We, we made a decision that as a practice that is situated within a 
post-colonial situation and a and a and a situation dealing with coloniality, we cannot be slavishly just making buildings without understanding the foundations of of the land, with under, without understanding the the nature of the charge of it, without understanding and, and informing ourselves. So whenever we make an intervention on a site, we need to know the narrative, like the full narrative. And often when you, you really immerse yourself into the analyzing the this, this site, and our analysis is very directly linked to Fred Moten's thinking around, you analyze anti-blackness in service of eradicating it, right? Um, so we don't analyze aimlessly. It is a very particular purpose for why we analyze so that we can begin to develop new spatial typologies, new spatial um, typologies that embraces freedom rather than oppression. Thank you. But, um, um, also has I, I can maybe just say is that uh, we are not uh, uh, transfixed on analysis of the past, uh, although we analyze the past deeply. Um, but so uh, one is to understand what actually happened, to dwell in the horror of that understanding for a moment. Um, but then also is to understand that we all were brought up through school, through university education, within another epistemology. Yeah. And that what is fundamental about working in a context like this, where you admit something is wrong, but you don't know how, is that you have to educate yourself through knowing the past, and you have to confuse your own certainty. So you, it's a very deliberate, strange, psychological thing to attack your own certainties and your own knowledge and the basis of your own knowledge. For that, research is fundamental. But you cannot stop there because then you are only pointing to the problem and you're not offering any kind of uh, ways out of it. You not you are. It appears to be pessimistic towards the future by just pointing out uh, how things were amiss in the past. So, uh, you know, in a single building project, there's something about making sure that its base is broad and reasonable in the kind of arguments that Ilza presented. But, you know, at a more fundamental level, you know, if we talk about spatial violence, it was at an urban level, segregation of people, racializing neighborhoods, setting up barriers, those sorts of things. And those things still sit there as living, breathing um, infrastructure of our cities. So we've been working on how to undo that infrastructure. So one is to see how infrastructures of removals or race constitute invisible infrastructures, like railways are visible and material infrastructures, to acknowledge that together with material infrastructures, you have immaterial infrastructures that play a role in shaping the city today. And then to say, how do we undo it with a kind of, uh, 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 you know, urgency that the situation demands? So some of the work that we did at Harvard, for instance, last year really looks at how that would be done. So in other words, be students. propositional and provocative with students. How can one unlock it? How would you design when you begin to doubt Roman Dutch law? Because Roman Dutch law stands there as this cultural edifice that is just absolutely right and without question. And it's the basis of our constitution. Now, we don't support lawlessness, but we support interrogating the basis of law to understand how it shapes the city. And uh, for instance, to give a very simple example, is you have property rights, and those things are balanced towards generally white, generally wealthy people. But because of a history of land alienation, you have people who have an entitlement to land because they were born here. But there's no way in our constitution how those two things are reconciled. So Roman Dutch law protects the one side and this mute on the subject of entitlement. But it shapes the city. So we've been looking at acting out on those entitlements and how that would shape the city and how it wouldn't just lead to a catastrophic klepto kleptocracy. So we indeed are propositional about these things and they confront us with this particularities of circumstance and also our need to collaborate with others in order to achieve these aims. How does this? Yeah, continue. 
the individual person it is a collective project um, and this and the, the more pluralities you have um, the more the wider the thing is because it is obviously can get extremely daunting um, if mm. you think of it as an individual project but as as soon as you think of it as a network as a collaborative as a collective project every intervention that you make becomes part of a collective um, spatial mm. logic of emancipation and it builds society yeah, yeah. My question was, uh, how does the city of Cape Town now tackle this this urban uh, yeah, dysfunction that you have? Um, because if you look at any uh, aerial photo from, from Cape Town, you see the distinct differences, right? So how is it now currently being treated, these, these borderlands or these, these, these yeah, crossings? Uh, and are you there also working on that? type of projects or are you trying to steer the conversation in a certain way? It's a very broad question. Um, I don't have one answer for it in terms of the city of Cape Town is a very huge body. It's a very huge system. So our work um, ends up work. We work with the city of Cape Town department, in this case, um, social development. Then we also then do add a project with uh, public spaces. So we, but I mean, if you look at the policy, if you're asking about the policy, it is a public document. <clears throat> but generally, it is a kind of a bureaucratic stance. It's not a stance that's rooted in a kind of analysis of, um, you know, it's 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 a liberal it's a liberal stance, you know, in my opinion. I can maybe just add yeah. is that the politics in South Africa is strange in that in the rhetoric, everybody tra talks about the transformation of yeah. the cities. Yet, when you look, what actually is happening mm -hmm. is that it is. Uh, uh, can you still hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, kicked us out. Oh, no, no we're still here. I still see you. Okay, okay so we're going to yeah, keep on so. talking. We can see you. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, so on the one hand, there's a rhetoric mm -hmm. of transformation. And the yeah. other hand, there's the actuality of what is happening in our cities. And that's pretty much nothing or a degradation of infrastructure. And what we are trying to do, hmm. just what's happening, and we said, well, if we have to summarize it, it's as little as possible. So it appears that those who have tried to hang on to it with dear life, hmm. to see how long they can last before they're caught out in seeing that first that holds it as opposed to being proactive and thinking how do we share the resources how do we share the wealth how do we find a way of being a society and moving forward um so the reality is very little is happening and lots of the work that we are doing is trying to sketch possible futures to add to the imagination of what is possible without a panic that that is a catastrophic future Thank you for that. Um, looking around the room. I'd like to advance you to look at the documentary White Balls and Walls, which was two, three days ago on Dutch television about the change process within the State Museum of Amsterdam. Uh, yeah, Amsterdam, which is a very nice way also about uh, some kind of structure. Uh, more diversity and inclusivity. And its name was? White Balls on Walls. White Balls on Walls. Is it possible we can change the setting so we can see you? Um, we don't know. I don't know how to do that. You look uh, on the right upper corner, corner, if you just say stop sharing, then... Uh, uh, stop sharing. No. You have to start the drink with that. Or otherwise, if you just click on uh, the, the small image uh, with us, you sh it should uh, pop up big on your screen now. Yeah, let's see. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, it should be there. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, we're going to share ourselves. We're going to share ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and then there will yeah, then we can stop, stop there again. sharing. Okay, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, that's it, good. Do you see this? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We need to finish it, so here go first. Yeah. I, I think you have to just go Okay, never mind, it's fine. Um, are there yeah. any other questions? We... I'm getting questions, yes. Thank you very much. Well, I think everyone is still in awe of uh, everything they heard. And we're really, really, happy, really happy that you uh, made the time for us. Yes, yeah? that's really okay. great. Getting yeah, I... new and to see the story. I, I would encourage everybody to just come come to Cape Town yeah. and just see, you know. That's yeah. the way to roll it. Feel free. <laughs> no, no, don't tell us twice. We would love to be there. Yeah. Sorry? So don't tell us twice. We would love to be there. Please yeah. come, but come in, come in, come in, um, yeah, and just come and visit. Come visit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. If you have 40 people on your doorstep, we can make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> mind, we're very friendly. Bring electricity. <laughs> and some beers as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Thank you, yeah. uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Which means we are going to move on to the to the Maui drink. Thank <laughs> you.